this morning it's it's a very we're going to have a very interesting discussion um and it's very much about looking forward um it's about what the new normal will look like um the role that technology will play and how we can all prepare um for this new normal um so thank you for joining us. My name is Ona Mahoney and I'm the Cluster Manager with IT at Cork. So it uh, gives me pleasure to welcome you all here this morning. And thanks for getting up early on this lovely sunny morning um, to, to dial in and join us. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about IT at Cork, if you're joining us for the first time for one of our webinars, you can go to our website, itcork.ie, or you can follow us on our social media channels. Um, just some useful tips and information before we kick off and, and so you can get the most out of this webinar. Um, this webinar is, is being recorded and it will be made available um, on our YouTube channel, uh, on our website and on our social media channels in the next week or so. Um, there will also be, I, I, we anticipate obviously a lot of questions for the panelists. Um, so you can use the Q&A tab below to submit your questions. Um, we will try to get around to as many as we can. We're gonna get around to those questions around 8.45. So um, please do submit your questions and uh, we'll get to them at the end. There are also um, audience polls. Um, so during the, the webinar, they will pop up intermittently. So um, please use them and vote them and interact with them. Be, and there uh, is our first poll that you'll see. Um, so your views are, are very important to us. Uh, so, so please interact with them. Um, we'll also make the results and the data from these polls uh, available on our website uh, uh, over the coming days as well. So without delay, I, I'm going to move over and ask and introduce um, the panelists. Um, and as I said, we have a really interesting um, lineup of panelists this morning. We have a IT project management expert in Pat Lucy. We have a city council CEO in Anne Doherty, and we have a futurist. Uh, Tom Raftery, and I must say I'm very envious of that title, um, Tom. That's that's um, I want to be a futurist when 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 I grow up. Um, so I'm just going to move on and ask everyone to introduce themselves. So um, Anne, could I start with you, please? Thanks, Phil. Good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me to participate this morning. My name is Anne Doherty. I'm the Chief Executive of Cork City Council. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Cork City Council is the organisation that runs the city. It's the only organisation with a democratic mandate, uh, governed by 31 elected members, uh, 1,500 staff, 210,000 citizens, and we have, provide services ranging from managing your cemeteries to your water, managing your traffic lights to your heritage, looking after your open space to 10,000 social housing homes, homeless, travellers, all those who are excluded and anything else that uh, anybody else sends our way. Excellent. Thanks, Anne. Um, Tom, please, over to you. Sure. Tom Raftery, uh, formerly from Cork, born and bred in Cork in Wilton, now living in Seville in the south of Spain. Uh, I work for SAP. SAP, for people who are unaware, are a large software company headquartered in Germany, but global. We have I think 170 countries we have offices in, uh, over 100,000 employees, revenue north of 25 billion a year. Um, we do a lot of back-end software. My role within SAP, I'm a global VP, uh, and as Owen said, my title is Futurist and Innovation Evangelist. So uh, I do a lot of uh, doing trends and scenarios on where things are going, uh, advising our customers and advising our internal people as well. So that's that's me. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. And finally, Pat. Thanks, Owen. Uh, delighted to join you this morning. So my name is Pat Lucy. I'm one of the two founders of Era. So we're a, a technology and project management consultancy headquartered in Cork, in Little Islands. We have offices in Dublin and Amsterdam and the team in Abu Dhabi as well. And we're quite similar to companies like Apple and Amazon in that we begin with the letter A. <laughs> about it in terms of similarities there. Um, from Limerick in Cork for almost 30 years and I just wanted to mention early that Limerick won the All-Ireland Hurling Final in 
18, just in case anybody forgot. Thanks, Pat, um, and thanks for thanks for reminding of, of 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 that All Ireland when you remind you actually remind me every time we have we have a call. But uh, thanks for reminding us again. Okay, um, so look, I I suppose I might start um, by putting a, a question to the panel. Um, you know, I suppose how has COVID impacted um, you and your business over the last uh, two months primarily? And Anne, I might start with you from a public service point of view. I'm sure um, I'm sure it's been very challenging managing um, public services over the last two months. Um, how how has your organisation dealt with um, with the challenges over the last two months or so? Um, thank, thanks, Owen. And as you've made reference, uh, public sector organisations, I suppose, is a little bit different because one of the things we couldn't do was uh, just reorganise our business to send everybody out of serve, out of office and work from home because of the nature of what we do. So obviously the most important thing for us initially was being very clear about our critical essential services. Um, fire service, water services, waste management, housing supports, uh, supports for the vulnerable, the homeless, travellers, um, those in direct provision. But also what became interesting very early on was there were new services that actually became really important. So for example, cemeteries were one of our critical essential services because of the predictions at the beginning about um, significant amount of, of um, deaths associated with COVID. So th there was interesting things that happened that you wouldn't have always thought of as critical services. Uh, parks, obviously, and green spaces became hugely important uh, very quickly because of the restrictions on movement of people and us all being asked to stay at home. So for us, it was about uh, ensuring that those services were resilient. So that was our first priority, building teams, uh, making sure that we had resilience built in, the team A, team B concept, etc. Also for some of those critical services, it was also about providing the capability for the, uh, some of the staff and those services to work from home very quickly, uh, which meant that we had to reorganise our, uh, we haven't a history of big working from home, so even the pieces that we had, we had to reorganise it very, very quickly. I suppose then we moved uh, into, I suppose, a phase whereby we looked at huge redeployment of staff. We provided and made available significant numbers of staff to the HSE for contact tracing and also for other services as they required. You know, the take-up wasn't as good as, as we would have liked, but we definitely had people moved. And then over a weekend, we were asked by the Ministry to set up a community response. You may have, uh, your people on the call may have heard of it, whereby we divided the city into teams. Um, we had people on the ground supported by a, a, a seven day week, um, 12 hour day uh, call service for people who were self-isolating, vulnerable, those cocooning, uh, that they could avail of services like someone going to the pharmacy, somebody getting their shopping or anything else that they needed. So we mobilized that service over a weekend. So again, we were redeploying and moving people into that. And the final piece, I suppose, that we had to do very quickly was then look at how do we support people to socially distance voluntarily, bearing in mind that we all voluntarily sign up to social distancing in our public spaces. So we have 29 different public spaces across the city. So we redeployed significant numbers of people to uh, become park rangers. So it was a very quick induction training, get people out. And these are people, some of them were people that were office based historically, but I suppose so proud of the staff of the, of the public service who were flexible, nimble and just got on with it. And then finally, I suppose I can't but acknowledge today and every day our amazing ICT team who are small in number but very high in quality, who we were changing, who needed remote working access uh, very quickly, very nimbly based on the movement of, of what was happening. So they're the types of things that we were doing. Um, I suppose we didn't have a history of working from home. Um, so that was a challenge and still remains a challenge. But I suppose then because of the nature of the type of service, actually we have a lot of people who were at work all the way through this, which sounds a little bit contravening the government plan, but actually the nature of the types of services that we had to provide. So that's a little bit about what we were doing. Thanks so Wow. Yeah. Sounds sounds like you've been busy, um, <clears throat> and I mean, I, I mean, well done on on uh, an absolute, I suppose, stellar, um, 
you know performance in in managing um such a huge a huge project i suppose and and in terms of um you know the all of this redeployment of staff to different roles different areas and and you mentioned even um you know moving teams remotely um you know is there was there any key learnings there do you think um from that um i i suppose people are amazing I think, you know, when the chips are down, the resilience of people and the commitment to, okay, what do you need me to do? In 99% of people, what do you need me to do? Where do you need me to be? And I think that, you know, that call to action to be back. People wanted to be part of the frontline response. Um, that's probably a public sector thing. And I think it's maybe not just, we all want it as citizens of Ireland wanted to be doing the right thing. So I think that was really, really important. I suppose for me, Personally, um, I came to things uh, that was uh, of interest and, and how that sometimes influenced uh, how people thought. And that was something maybe that you had to put a little bit more time and invest in the reassurance about that it is okay, that, it, you know, that the arrangements are in place to keep you safe as you do your job and we need you to do your job. So I think that the, the time to invest in that it's hard to see when you're in the middle of a crisis, but it's always needed. So that to me would be a big learning. Excellent, excellent. Um, thanks, thanks, Anne. Um, Pat, I might ask you um, next. I mean, as an IT managed service company, you must have seen a lot over the last um, over the last two months in 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 looking at how how companies have managed the remote transition um, and managed how they, they they've managed their workforce. Um, what have your what what is your main observations been? Um, you, you know, and Anne mentioned resilience. Um, how how have companies responded to this? I, I suppose seismic change and shift. Yeah. So. Um... It's interesting listening to Anne and, and you know, some of the challenges that she faced in the range of services that she has to su continue to support. You know, it's uh, very impressive what, what uh, her organization has achieved. In our case, um, it was easier for us because we are a technology company. Um, we already had all our systems cloud-based. So, you know, it's just as easy for us to work from home as it is from anywhere else, as long as we have decent broadband, um, which most of us have, have been able to get. Um, so, but the, the changes have been different according to the sectors that you work in. Um, on, on the people front, our, our people are typically either project managers or software developers, technology people. And if you can caricature it, it's a bit like the project managers are the extroverts, the, the people who like going out there. They're the solar powered people who get their energy from, from others around them. Whereas our software developers tend to be more introverts, more battery powered, powered from within. And it's been interesting because I've seen over the last couple of months, it's the extroverts who seem to be suffering more from the lockdown scenario. People are used to being out there, you know, uh, high-fiving and uh, kissing babies and shaking hands and getting projects delivered are the ones who have found it tougher now to be locked in their basement or wherever it is and uh, delivering projects and still keeping their energy levels up. So thankfully, technology has been the, effectively the, the solar bed that's a re replacement for, for that. You know, the use of technology such as Teams, such as Zoom, um, such as the various uh, tools we've been able to use has really managed to keep that, that people connection up. Um, previously, I would, my excuse for being late for meeting was that I was backed up in the Jack Lynch tunnel. Now I'm just backed up with Teams meetings after Teams meeting, you know, so I still, I still have an excuse. Um, on the customer front, we saw a lot of variation. I mean, obviously, sectors like aviation were hit immediately. Right? We, do, we do a lot of work in the aviation sector. So those projects were, within a couple of days, those being um, reprioritized and deprioritized right? and put on pause. Um, other sectors, such as uh, retail in the non-food sector, also hit. I mean, everything shut down. And, and uh, my family upbringing in is a, is a family retail business. So straight away, anything like that, um, you know, the doors were shut, which is a big issue for not just for the business, but for the community around it. Um, also, there have been some sectors hit that I didn't think would have been hit immediately. Some financial services companies, particularly those whose revenues come from foreign exchange. There's nobody traveling anymore. Um, the need for foreign exchange has dropped a lot. So that's been a hit. 
manufacturers of medical devices. Um, in many cases, had to, to basically cease production. There's nobody getting any elective surgeries anymore. So the, as the lockdown has gone on, it's caused lots of different businesses to, to have to cease production or pause production. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the, the predictions. The predictions from the IMF last month were for a V-shaped model. Now they're talking about a Nike swoosh model that it might take a little longer to, to recover again. But um, our uh, prediction is that a surge will come. And when that surge comes, I expect then there'll be extreme pressure on people to get everything back on track again as it was. You know, so uh, there's a real difference depending on the sector as to how the, the organizations and companies have responded. But technology is the common. Technology is the, it's not the cure, but it's, the, it's, it's easing the symptoms of the, the current situation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Excellent, Pat. Thanks for that. And you mentioned how it's impacted people. I think you'd certainly fall into the project management ex and extrovert category um, who, who's not out and about as much. Um, Tom, I might, might move on to you next. Um, I know digital transformation is is very much your bread and butter um, and you know you have an excellent oversight in the whole area of digital transformation and innovation um, there's been a phenomenal um, I suppose um, amount of digital transformation and innovation in a very short period of time what you know are your uh, I suppose key observations from that um, you know where have you seen most impact in digital transformation yeah so <clears throat> I think um, the answer is it depends <laughs> as with many of these things um, if we look across our customer base uh, and you know we have customers in every industry uh, so we, we very quickly can see who are being impacted and who not and in what ways. Um, and, you know, Pat's point about the aviation industry is well made. Uh, but even there, uh, it, the answer also there is it depends because, sure, the passenger airline industry has cratered. But on the other hand, the cargo industry has just gone up by that. You know, you, the, the prices... Uh, for movement in cargo industry now have gone through the roof because there's no space. And a lot of the space has been taken up by PPE, which is extremely bulky and very light. Uh, so it takes up an awful lot of room in these cargo flights. Um, we provide services to many different industries again. Uh, so, for example, we've seen one of our businesses concur. Uh, concur manages travel expenses. <laughs> Obviously, demand for that has just fallen away. On the other hand, we uh, supply software into uh, the supply chain sector. And I mean, the, the demand for that has just exploded because uh, to your point, uh, people are realizing now the requirement for digitizing their everything, but particularly their supply chains. Um, the digital transformation uh, term itself you know originated really or came to the fore originally we'll say about five years ago and people were talking about their digital transformation this and they were you know standing up chief digital officers and things like that and you had you know proofs of concept being rolled out and people talking about yeah we're going to digitize this in the next four years or whatever it is and suddenly it's happening in in weeks and months rather than years because there's this huge burning platform uh, and I have mentioned supply chain because that's the one where it's really hit hardest. Um, people who haven't had uh, views, proper views into their supply chain, who people whose supply chains haven't been resilient enough uh, have been hit hardest. So people who had gone early and digitized their supply chain have seen the, the best results. They've the one, they're the ones who have been able to react uh, most quickly. I was speaking to... Um, a woman called Isabel Leclerc, uh, and I published a podcast that I did with her just earlier this week. And she's VP supply chain for a company called Cascades. And if you're not familiar, Cascades are uh, one of the world's largest producers of, amongst other things, toilet paper. So obviously it was kind of a topical conversation uh, because we all saw how the demand for toilet paper surged. Uh, but speaking to her, she said, actually, it was just a shift in demand 
rather than a, an increase in demand because there's two, and I was unaware of this, but apparently there's two markets for toilet paper. There's the residential market and then there's the commercial and industrial market. And of course, demand shifted from commercial and industrial to the residential as people stopped working in, you know, commerce and industry has stopped working in those places and shifted to working from home. So uh, that, that was an interesting learning from that. And of course, uh, her, her whole distribution mechanism had to align to meet that shift in demand. So, and again, all that's done with the things like scenario planning that you have with uh, uh, planning applications and supply chain. And uh, we uh, in SAP, because we supply into that space, uh, we stood up several uh, cloud-based free offers for our customers to help them more quickly get on board and more quickly to digitize their supply chain. And I'm not saying we're fantastic for doing that. Other companies did similar things. It's all a question of helping your customers and make sure that they can survive through this so that they can then thrive when things start to you know, come back to the new normal or new abnormal or whatever it will be. Okay, excellent. And Tom, I presume with Ireland as an island, um, you know, very resilient, um, you know, digitized supply chains is, is uh, you know, important now more than ever. And that's where companies need to be investing their time for the, the medium, the, you know, the medium to long term. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like I, like I said, I mean, this is not, uh, I mean, the, 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 the um, the, the title of, of today's webinar is about life after COVID. And, you know, it's a bit early to be talking about that because, you know, we're looking, you know, 18, 24 months before we get out of this until the vaccine has been widely distributed. And we're going to have second and third waves in that time. So supply chains are going to hit more shocks, you know, uh, again, as more countries go back into lockdown or more regions go back into lockdown. And suddenly, if you don't have a distributed and resilient supply chain that you have visibility into, uh, and you don't have proper planning in place, you would be in trouble. Uh, so the more that you can see into your supply chain, the more agile and resilient it is, mm. the better. And the only way really to do that is to have a digital one that you can see all aspects of it. Mm. Okay. Now I might move on to the whole area of um, city and urban living um, because that is one area that has really been impacted um, quite significantly as a result of the lockdown and um, restrictions on social distancing. And Anne, I might start with you again. Um, you know, as as we're as there is a phased reopening, and you know we do anticipate greater footfall, greater people coming into the city centre. Um, what wh how is Cork City Council, what, 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 how are you preparing for this? Uh, thanks, so I suppose like every business, um, internally we're challenged with all of the things of social distancing, how do we get people back up and running doing the jobs they used to do. For me, one of the challenges is we've deployed people to do very different things that, and I think Tom made a good point, like we're now not recovering from COVID, we're living with COVID and some of the things we put in place are still required and so it's that balancing that with the things we used to do. So that's just an internal challenge. But far more important is the work we're doing with all our partners in the city. So for the last number of weeks, we've been working through our city centre partnership, which involves business, transport and um, other agencies in the city. Um, across all the different sectors to look at what do we need to do to get the city back up and functioning. And I suppose we're very mindful that the most important thing for everybody now is safety. It actually is the first thing in everyone. How do I feel safe? How will I feel? What are the things that worry me? So one of the things we have done is we changed a psychologist to work with us. I know you're probably interesting in a in an IT uh, discussion, but actually the psychology of all of this is actually going to be a huge motivator, we feel. So that whole piece about people feeling safe and comfortable in the city is going to be huge. So for that reason, the first thing we did was a big deep clean. Um, and uh, you, well, hopefully those of you who've been to the city will have seen that. Now you probably say, why don't you do it all day, every day? And that's a very good question, but obviously it was a lot easier when there was, when there was nobody around. But then there was this balance about being out scrubbing the streets when actually the message was people should be at home. So, you know, I was getting phone calls saying, why are your staff out cleaning when they should be at home? So it's interesting what, you know, that's back to what's motivating people and what they're concerned about. 
So then I suppose that's one of the first big things we did. And then I suppose the other big thing we're doing then is looking at how can we make the space of the city more usable. So we are out of public consultation at the moment and um, just for one week uh, because we're trying to move things quite quickly about just introducing more pedestrianisation. Uh, during the lockdown, we had opened up the areas that were pedestrianised previously to facilitate workers because there was no parking ride, etc. And um, so they were first to go back in and they went in and on the day one of the first phase of the lockdown. But we're now looking at places like Emma Place, Father Matthew uh, Street, Fitton Street, Liberty Street, uh, Ron Paul Street, Dawn Square, Tucky Street, to try and introduce more and more pedestrianisation just to give people, because obviously there's going to be queuing on the streets in terms of access to premises, but so that when people pass each other, that they're not feeling so, so um, uh, cramped. And we're also looking at things like uh, changing the pedestrian prioritisation at the traffic lights, so that you know that's a that's a point of pinch point. If people are queuing, so that we give more prioritisation to pedestrians at traffic lights. For example, that's just another example. The other things we're looking at is more bike parking stands. Um, there's definitely um, an opportunity to implement lots of the things we all want for the city. We have a city centre movement strategy. We also have this uh, Cork Metropolitan Area Transport Strategy, which talks very strongly about the role of pedestrianisation, the role of using walking, cycling, and public transport first, and then using the car only when we have to. Now, we're a long way away from getting there, but this is an opportunity, I think, maybe to put some acceleration into that. So we're looking at more bike stands and obviously trying to look at more key cycling routes. Now that's a longer thing to implement because of the nature of, of how you make some of those roadworks happen. And um, also looking at things like can we do some park and cycle uh, you know, uh, adjacent to the city. Um, again, um, looking at I suppose, lots of input from lots of people about how and what we do that. So they're the types of things we've been looking at. The other thing I suppose that's really important for our city, and I think that um, when there's a discussion, and I know later on we'll be talking maybe a little bit about the future and the future of urban, but there, there is a risk that urban becomes unpopular in all of this COVID piece. And I think that there's urban and there's urban. There are different urbans. So we have a really, really unique product in Cork. We have a small city. It is quite compact, but it's also um, not over densified. Yes, we will need to do some densification, but the plan is never to densify like maybe some other European cities. So I think that there's a real opportunity in Cork um, to actually use this experience to strengthen that urban planning. And so, for example, we're doing work on a street by street basis with all the partners on a particular street, be it Princess Street, or at the moment we're doing some work with the people on McCurtain Street. And that's the uniqueness of our city. You can do that because it is it is smaller and therefore you can get better solutions and hopefully get way, way better buy-in. So they're the types of things that we're doing at the moment. Mm. Excellent. Excellent. Can I ask a quick question there, Anne? Yeah, sure. Uh, it, it's great to hear you talk about uh, expanding the, the bike networks and that uh, and that's fantastic for air quality issues. I'm just curious, I didn't hear any mention about uh, prioritising electric vehicles or purchasing of electric vehicles or anything like that. Is that anything on your radar? No, no, it is. As a, as a local authority, we have almost gone 100% electric. We have the biggest electric fleet in the public service in the country, uh, which yes. we are going to launch with great fanfare in uh, in uh, March. But obviously, uh, I don't think that the appetite would have been there for us. <laughs> so our vehicles actually have been out. They're branded. They're called We Care. You might have seen them around. Uh, they're white with We Care uh, on them, which is a bit of a play on We Are Cork, um, which is our place brand, as, as you know, Tom. Uh, so, um, our, yeah, no, absolutely, electric vehicles are all part of that. But I suppose, you know, people are congested. Like, I think one of the fears I have that we've all become so COVID obsessed. I'm using that word for myself. It's all I talk about all day, every day, think about all day, every day, that we shouldn't lose sight of the bigger prize. You know, the climate challenge is still there, sustainability yeah. is still there, and will be there after COVID. And as you said, Tom, like COVID will, will come and go. It will leave scars. There is no doubt about that. Um, but that the bigger picture, we shouldn't lose sight of it. So that's why we're trying to reroute all our thinking and, every, and trying to get people back thinking to, you know, what were the big strategies we were looking at, be it transport strategies or urban development strategies, and how now can we use the learning here to actually make, to strengthen them. Fantastic, great. Thanks, Anne. And actually, Tom, I might bring you in there because from, um, you know, 
where you're based in Seville and from um, a European city's perspective, um, you're probably a little bit further um, down, down the line in terms of reopening cities. Um, obviously, there, and Anne mentions the density of population is, is a factor in an inner city. Um, how, how are cities in, in Spain um, managing or how have they managed, you know, uh, gradual reopening? Yeah, it's, it's, it is a gradual done in phases reopening and it's actually done at different paces in different parts of the country. So uh, the two regions in Spain that were worst hit were uh, Madrid and Catalonia and uh, they are opening at a slower pace than the rest of the country. They're one phase behind most of the rest of the country. So that in itself, you know, presents challenges, uh, but is also interesting just um, uh, academically to, to, to observe. Um, we had the harshest lockdown globally outside of China uh, here in Spain. Um, we could not leave our homes unless we were going for groceries, going to the pharmacy or to walk dogs. Uh, so suddenly the demand for dogs went up. <laughs> um, you know, and if you were leaving uh, to walk the dogs, you could only do it within a kilometer of home and only for something like half an hour a day and only if you were an adult. Uh, and I discovered this uh, by accident because I, we have two dogs and I was allowing our kids to walk them in the evening and I would walk them in the morning uh, and our kids were stopped by the police and told to return straight to home and if they went out again they would be fined 600 euro. And my kids are like 14, 17. It's not like they're, you know, young, uh, particularly. So it was, it's a, it was a very harsh lockdown and it's been gradually eased back. Um, in terms of uh, grocery stores and pharmacies that you could go to, they have security guards at the entrance and exit. Uh, and on entrance, you are asked to wear a face mask. Uh, if you don't have one, you're not let in you are asked to wear gloves which are provided and these are like the you know uh, plastic disposable gloves that you might often find in a shop uh, at, at vegetable um, um, stands you know to, to pick up the, the, the vegetables these are now at the entrance to the uh, stores and you are required to wear them to be allowed in so that you're not bringing in anything on your hands and you're not touching stuff on, on the shelves and then you obviously dispose of them when you leave. There are also uh, disinfectant dispensers at the entrance to most of these uh, sh shops as well and at the exits. Um, you are required to wear a face mask on public transport uh, and the uh, what happens there is there are police at the entrances to the big public transport stations and if you don't have a mask you are provided with one uh, because it was it wasn't always easy to get masks uh, initially um, you know so and now we are allowed out at certain hours of the day and that's broken out by age groups so different age groups are allowed out for half an hour or an hour at different times of the day uh, in areas that are further along in the de-escalation, which is where we are here in Andalusia, for example, uh, we are now allowed to meet in uh, family groups of up to 10 people. Uh, bars and restaurants are allowed to reopen if they have terraces and if they can maintain the physical distancing of two meters between tables, which obviously means that the bars and restaurants uh, can only be at about 30% of capacity. And when we get into the next phase, it'll be 50% of capacity. So, you know, it, it's been a very gradual release. Uh, there's been pushback, uh, particularly by the far right groups here, um, you know, mimicking what they're seeing coming out of the US, unfortunately. Uh, but for the most part, uh, it's it's been it's been well observed. I mean, we've had twenty seven thousand uh, deaths here in Spain. Uh, we've had over two hundred thousand people infected. So, people are taking it quite seriously, um, understandably, uh, thankfully. Okay, thanks, thanks, Tom. And um, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting to see. Um, y y you know, the different measures. The the as as you said, a very very harsh restrictions um, that had to be taken and, you know, we just hope to, that, that, that um, you know, the, the, the reopening um, that will be very positive for the country. Um, Pat, I might 
um, ask you, uh, you know, you, in terms of, again, you would have seen um, from a remote work point of view, um, you know, with the phase reopening, are we going to see, you know, in one of the polls we asked actually about remote working, are people, are they going to be more inclined to remain with remote working or, or will they return to the office? What's your view on that? Um, do you think we're going to see more remote working or will it be a hybrid of on-site and remote working? How do you think it will play out? Sure. So at the risk of stating my view and then your poll uh, disproving me, I will just claim that your poll is wrong. So uh, I think there's a lot of uncertainty going on right now. But one thing you can be absolutely certain about is that we will never return back to the way things were. Uh, so when it comes to remote working, uh, if COVID-19 disappeared tomorrow and people were told you can go back to the way it was, we wouldn't go back to the way it was. We'll go back to a new way of working. And I talk about my own company, Aspira. I mean, I, I've always been someone who, I guess, was reasonably tolerant of people remote working, but I viewed a project manager role as a role that needed to be hands-on, you know, working with the team, not done from home. And now our project managers are all working from home and it's all going great. So I've had my eyes opened. I, I've seen that, um, you know, with the right technology and the right approach, it can be done and some of our staff are itching to get back into the office. More of our staff are delighted not to get back. Uh, they will be happy if they never have to go back to the office. They avoid long commutes, they can be more productive, they can have better work-life balance. So I, for one, will certainly be um, much more open to that and I would anticipate that you know, some of our staff will become remote workers full-time or maybe occasionally drop into the office uh, and I expect that will happen not just in, in Aspira but that will happen all over the, the, the country. And I think it's, it's, there will be challenges though, because if I think back to our, you know, our, our normal monthly ops reviews where you have 16 people sitting around a table and normally we have one or two people from different locations dialing in, those people tend to feel excluded or you know, they're, they're, we all take a break for, for coffee and say, oh, oh, we'll be back. Sorry, I forgot about you there on, on the call. Uh, now those people feel much more equal with the rest of the organization because we're all at home, we're all dialed in. There isn't a, a separate cabal in a room somewhere that's uh, discussing what's going on. So when we do go back to the workplace, um, we need to set up our communication systems and structures and the way we make decisions in the same way. We can't go back so it's just the people in the room that get to have the inside discussions and make decisions. Uh, you have to treat the people working remotely on an equal footing and reconfigure our communication mechanisms to make that happen. Um, something I'd, I'd pick up from what Anne said earlier, uh, I think it's going to be a tough balancing act, encouraging people into the city centre by telling them that you have to use public transport is going to be tough because what I see, it, our office in Cork is a little island where people can use the train service or, they, or a lot of them drive themselves, but our offices in Dublin and Amsterdam, our people are pretty much 100% reliant on public transport to get there. And those people have said to me, well, I, we don't want to go back anytime soon. Uh, and it's, the, it's the, the public transport that concerns them. They don't want to be, you know, squeezing onto a Lewis or, or, uh, or jumping on a bus beside God knows who uh, until they feel a lot more confident that the, the public health measures are, are suppressed. Okay, thanks, Pat. Um, for just, just a little observation, it's good to see that questions are coming in, um, so please feel free to use the Q&A tab uh, to get your questions in and we'll, we'll get to them in about um, five or ten minutes. Um, and just as I suppose a natural um, progression from Pat's last point around transport and the movement of people, um, I think it's fascinating that you're working with, um, that the City Council is working with a, a psychologist um, and obviously uh, the psychology is going to play a key role in people, uh, the movement of people back into the city centre and using public transport um, again. So. What do you see as, you know, in terms of footfall, do you, do you expect to see, um, you know, a, a surge or an increase in people coming back into the city centre using public transport? Will it be a little bit more gradual? Um, how do you think it'll play out? I think Pat's observation is spot on. Uh, and I, I think we actually 
probably don't know. One of, our, one of the risks for us, I think, in Cork is that we have poor modal shift. We, have, we were on the journey of modal shift, getting people to, to change from the way they travel to work. Like our modal shift in Cork is very low in terms of the amount of people who are using public transport, who are cycling or walking to work. Obviously, we've made huge strides over the last number of years. Uh, bus airing numbers were up very, very significantly. The suburban rail from the east of the city was really, really important as well. And I suppose that's been the whole premise of what we've been trying to achieve. Um, I, I think, I suppose there's a couple of things that's really, really important. The incidence rates of uh, this disease in Cork is really, really low. It's about, um, it's about 200 per 100,000 population of infection. Our death rate, we've had 59 deaths in Cork and Kerry since the beginning of this. So, I mean, I think that, uh, and I think Tom's point about different parts of Spain moving at different paces is really, really important. So I do think that um, while the, the risks are there in terms of how people um, might respond, I do think that it's important that we, uh, one of the things that is really communication about uh, what those risks are or are not. Um, definitely to our partners in Bosserne and in um, Irish Rail are part of our city centre partnership. Their capacity is significantly reduced. Um, obviously, the um, public health advice in relation to face covering in the use of public transport, we're not in the mask space, Tom, we're in the face covering uh, on a voluntary, not in a mandatory way, we should give some comfort to people. There are people, and I suppose our biggest risk is that people move our back to the car. And so it's about how do we prevent that happening? So I saw one of your questions and there was, you know, why aren't we rolling out more cycle lanes? Um, you know, it's not that we're not ambitious to do it. It's just some of the barriers to making it happen. And some of it is, is in relation to uh, resources and we're trying to attract resources. The NTA fund Dublin very differently to how they fund Cork. Um, so that's, that's important. I think it's important as well. And this is where digital information can be so important. Having real-time information about transport. People don't want to be hanging around. They don't want to be missing, um, you know, if a bus doesn't turn up, that will take. So that real-time information is going to be so, so important. I think it's a risk and, and it's one that worries me because it will be back to congestion. All we've achieved, we'll have lost. But I just think that um, it's back again to uh, people feeling comfortable to come in and um, things not being overcrowded, things that run efficiently. And that's where information, I think, is going to be so important. I'm not sure if that answers you, but it's kind of my own personal rumination. No, no, that's 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 a really, I, I suppose, a really good overview. And as you said, you don't, it, it's it's so hard to predict. Um, it's it's um, it's it's changing, you know. Um, so it's it's very hard to predict those patterns. Um, Pat, I might come come back to you. You know, you said um, managing. I I think which is very interesting, um, managing people equally from working um, that will choose to come on site and those that work remotely. Um, I think that's a very interesting point um, around around the psychology of it as well. Would you ju just like to elaborate on that a little bit more? Sure. So there's, I'm sure a lot of you have been in the scenario where you are. The remote person dialing into a, a conference bridge or, or dialing into a scenario where there's a bunch of people sitting around a table together you know making decisions or, or viewing progress and it is very difficult it's very difficult to exert influence to um, be really on board of what's going on the whole spotting the nod and the wink and the body language that that can tell a lot when you're in these meetings so i've been in that situation i know i always feel i'm i'm a couple of playing with a couple of hands short of, of the full deck in that scenario. Um, whereas now everybody is in the same boat. We're all sitting alone and we all have one, um, you know, s similar focus. So I know what we've been thinking about when we come back is reconfiguring our, uh, our boardrooms so that the central focus um, remains the hub so that people who are uh, accessing remotely will still have same access to everything that everybody else has. And that can be done through a combination of physical reconfiguration of offices and also use of technology. Um, and I think it'll be important we do it because um, we want, in, in our company, we want people coming back into the office to be my personal choice. If they want to do it, um, great, you know, happy to have them. We have the space, we can, we can do the social distancing. If they don't want to do it, they've already proven to me that they can deliver and they can be trusted to deliver. 
So there's no problem there from, from my regard. And we're lucky we're in a kind of environment, we're in an IT enterprise environment where we can do that. I know not every business has, has the luxury of, of giving people the option, but I think if you do have that option, you should let people avail of it. Okay, very good. Thanks, Pat. I'm just a little bit conscious of time, so I'd like to get to um, uh, uh, a few um, questions. Um, this, I think, might be for Anne. Um, in comparison with Dublin, why is uh, the response in Cork um, uh, in terms of implementing pop-up bike lanes um, to facilitate commuting? I think you've kind of answered that question already, Anne, have you? I think I have, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I'm just going to look at another one here. Um, I have one here, a supply chain related question, Tom. Um, this, uh, this is from Mike McGrath. Describe digitization of supply chains or what technologies are best or best practices for such digitization. This is your sure. opportunity for an SAP plug. <laughs> sure, no, I, I, I'm not going to do that because, you know, we're not the only ones in this space. There are plenty of companies offering these kind of solutions. But basically, we kind of think of supply chain as everything from uh, the, the, the initial planning uh, to the making, to the distribution, to the operation, right through to even the operation, because we're getting into a world as of, of product as a service, and many of the products that people are making now have inbuilt sensors, and they can be sold or they can be given as a uh, given and billed as the as as they're operated as opposed to being sold so that that has become part of the whole supply chain as well the operation of the end device so it's everything from uh, planning making delivering and, and operating of devices and having all of that being shifted to uh, being done digitally is is what we see and what, what do I mean by that well uh, I mean shifting to a an, a system which is um, ideally cloud-based for managing everything around uh, the, 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 as I said, the planning, but also the manufacturer, etc. Uh, having cloud-based manufacturing, which can, which means the machines can talk to each other, which means the operators of the machines have like uh, tablets or iPhone devices or whatever, and they can see all of the orders that are coming down the line. They can see everything that is happening. When an order is placed by a customer on the company website, it can talk to the machines and the machines can configure and, and organize that the, part, the right parts are at the right station at the right time and the right operator sees all the bills and materials for that individual device so that, you know, the, the, the lines can reconfigure dynamically based on orders coming in from customers on websites. That's the kind of level of digitization I'm talking about. And then through to uh, managing enterprise warehousing as well, so that everything is known where it is and as it's being shipped uh, from warehouse to customer or as it's being shipped to, uh, as it's being brought in to supply manufacturers uh, so that they can make components you can track and trace everything through that supply chain as well you know all the way through to customers when they take end delivery they can look back through the supply chain and see every component and part of it and increasingly what we're saying now and I, what others will start saying soon as well is that if you are a manufacturer you should be able to look down through your supply chain not just to see the costs of all the various components but also to see their carbon footprint and this is something we are going to enable our customers to do to look down through the supply chain and see cost but also carbon footprint so that they can use that as a filter to choose the uh, suppliers with the lower carbon footprint if that's their desire and that way they can reduce their scope three emissions okay okay thanks tom very comprehensive answer thanks for that um pat this one's for you what has pat learned most about his own business in the first instance and how does he foresee a quick bounce back in it consultancy post covid so i guess what i've learned is that there's a lot of hidden talents in in our team talents that i didn't realize uh, were there so for example as part of the our initial to, to try to um, you know help people out we started off a weekly webinar campaign ourselves that we've been doing every Wednesday for the last couple of months 
And I, I've asked, I didn't do any of them. I asked our different leaders in, in our business if they would choose a topic that they're expert in and deliver an hour long webinar. Most of them had never stood up and spoken, you know, in a public forum before. Any of them has done it and they've been brilliant. And they've really, uh, you know, we've got fantastic feedback from it. They, they really shared their, their knowledge. Uh, and I think it's just an example of how people, and, I, and, and talked about it earlier, the way people are willing to, to do more, you know, to, to volunteer. It's brought out a great uh, esprit de corps with, with people. I know another one, my own son volunteered. He's, a, he's in college studying maths. He volunteered to give online grinds to the Leaving Cert students of our staff members and our customers. And he did that for a few weeks. And then the leaving search, we know what happened there, right? So, so the fact that he was willing to do it, again, I, he's a guy, he's a shy and quiet guy. I didn't think he'd do it. So people have, have really stepped up to do things that um, I never thought they would have. And in one way, I guess the fact that they're sitting in their own homes doing it gives them a degree of comfort. Maybe they're more willing to, to move outside their comfort zone uh, in other ways. In terms of IT consultancy, it's all going to depend on the, the slope of the recovery. So... Um, so some industries, as uh, Tom mentioned, are, are going busier than ever. Um, some are going to have to recover and they're expected to deliver on their past commitments. Um, that's going to mean they have to figure out ways of working smarter, uh, leveraging you know, smart solutions. Um, and that's where a lot of our work comes in, helping people to, to deliver um, with, with less stress on them. So there still is going to be a lot of opportunity there. Okay, excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Um, and just a question for you. Um, in the unlikely and, and unfortunate um, situation, if some of your staff um, become ill, what kind of contingency plans can you execute, execute to keep um, our city going? Yeah, no, thank you. Really, really good question. So I mentioned at the beginning that uh, very early on we had to define our critical essential services and put resilience plans into them. They, those plans still remain. So, for example, our fire department, we have changed their ship roster, we've changed their accommodation so that we have complete resilience. The same with the water treatment facility out in the Lee Road, a beautiful old uh, water treatment facility uh, that is. Um, uh, let's put it away, it, it needs careful handling by people who know how to do it. So the very same thing, we've built resilience into those teams so that they are completely uh, separate from each other. They work opposite each other. So if one goes down, we have the, the resilience built in. So that's the type of thing for those critical essential services, uh, which we've defined um, in our own contingency, in our own contingency plan. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Anne. I think we have time for one more question, and it's actually a really, really good question. I think either Tom or, or, or Pat or both of you can answer it. With remote um, working proving so successful, do you think companies will now be open to hiring staff globally and from remote rural communities and not just those who are based in a particular country or near an office location? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think this will be a big trend because uh, why wouldn't you? I mean, if you have the whole world uh, to choose your next employee from, why would you uh, choose someone who is within X kilometers of you just as that, using that as your filter? Um, we are going to see a huge shift to remote working. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is going on for uh, 18, 24 months, likely. Um, worst, or best case scenario is 12 months from now, at, you know, and that's, that's really unlikely. So we're only two, two and a half months into it, uh, and this is going to persist. It's going to persist until we have a vaccine. Uh, it's going to persist because uh, insurance companies will rightly insist that employers uh, can show that they're maintaining physical distancing between employees. So uh, offices that were configured for the, the old normal, in many cases, won't be able to do that with a full complement of people coming back to work. So people, we will see reduced numbers of people in the office. So uh, employers will, and employees are getting used to working remotely, working from home, uh, and in many cases, enjoying it. I know 
I've been working from home when I'm not traveling. I've been working out of home uh, for, I don't know how many years now, but, you know, one and a half decades at least. So for me, it's nothing new, but for many people, it's new. And they're finding, you know, actually, this is quite pleasant. I'm not having to commute for an hour every day stuck in traffic. And, you know, I can get up and go into the kitchen and make a nice coffee whenever I want. And yeah, there are certain things you miss, like not meeting people in the canteen, <laughs> you know, your coworkers and having those conversations. But uh, as Pat said, if you set up these kind of weekly webinar things where people can get together and you try and facilitate that kind of thing, you can, you know, mitigate some of those downsides. And can I just say, in addition to, to what Tom said, I, I think it's already happening now. So we're using the phrase resourcing sans frontier, as in um, the need for location suddenly has gone out the window clients in the UAE who previously it was mandatory that the, our staff had to be physically in their office, had to go through a retina scanner to get in the building, all kinds of. Now they're working from Cork, they're working from Scotland. Uh, we have a guy working from um, Bulgaria all right, on, on the projects. It doesn't matter where they are as long as we can guarantee security, as long as we have the full protections and the firewalls and all the systems in their VPNs uh, protected. Uh, we've we've got people now working from locations that wouldn't have been considered as an option three months ago. That's very interesting. Thanks, Pat. Um, sorry, go ahead, Anne. Because I, I think it's really really interesting, and uh, you know, it, it, I think then it, the quality and the type of urban space that then where people live is going to become more and more important. Because if people are like work for a lot of people is social as well as work. Um, we spoke of there, you know, people missed. I said this previously in a, in a call with you on that I miss other people. You know, I miss the innovative and creative juices that flow from that. So we still need to have really quality urban spaces. We do need. I mean, cities are resilient. Cities have survived wars, floods, pandemics. You know, they will still be important places when we go back to the other ambitious things we're trying to achieve from a whole of world or a whole of globe perspective. And um, so I think that it's important that we don't lose sight of that um, and that we collect. So for us, and this is maybe my call here, is that we're just about to do our new development plan. So we're going to have to engage with people very differently about that. So it's going to be important that people do because it is about having uh, quality design in our cities and resilience in that design. And that's you know the input of everybody into that because otherwise, you know, things could become quite uh, quite boring for people in terms of life you know it's not just mm. about the work Excellent. Thanks, Anne. And I think, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it on that note, but it's a very bright note to, to leave it on that um, cities are resilient and they, they will fight back and they have been faced many challenges before. Um, I know the questions are still coming in, but un unfortunately, we've just run out of time. I'm, I'm conscious of our panellist time and we all need to get to work as well. I'd just like to say a big thank you to our panellists, to Tom Raftery, Pat Lucy and Anne Doherty. Um, thanks for your time this morning. Thanks for giving your time in, in, in preparing for the webinar. I really appreciate it. Um, also, thanks to all the attendees that joined us this morning. Thanks for your time. As I said, um, we will have um, some data from, from the webinar um, and, and a recording of the webinar to follow. Um, Tom, we, we hope to see you at our, our, our virtual tech summit in September, um, where you can give a, a deeper dive in um, to the future of tech and, and technology trends. So on, on that note, I'd just say, like to say thanks again to everyone. and. Um, we hope to stay safe and stay well, and, and we'll see you shortly. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks folks. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.